the Web 3.0 and crypto space holds endless opportunities to make life-changing money. After all, you have open access to a brand new permissionless financial ecosystem, but this can definitely come with its fair share of risk. You know, year to date, over $2 billion has been lost in crypto hacks. And as a blockchain developer, you have a massive edge to take a share of some of these profits. So not maybe what you're thinking. And I'm not talking about going out and stealing money for yourself, but I'm talking about actually finding these things before they take place spotting the security vulnerabilities and then disclosing them to other people who will gladly pay you large sums of money to protect their own funds, okay? So people ask me all the time, how do you do this? Well, in this video, I'm gonna break down a specific vulnerability that you can spot out in the wild so you can add this to your tool belt. I'm gonna talk about all this as a blockchain developer myself who works with this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step -step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's jump into this. Let's talk about how to hack smart contracts with delegate call, okay? So what we're going to cover in this lesson is, you know, what is delegate call? Uh, we're going to look at an actual coding demonstration step-by-step -step, and then also a real-world use case or a real world hack example where this actually took place so that you can understand how to spot it in the real world. So let's start off with understanding what delegate call is in the first place. Okay, so Solidity has a few different low level functions like call and delegate call. And essentially what they do is they let you send a message to any address. Okay, this address can be uh, a smart contract, the address can be uh, you know, another address, like an externally owned account, like a MetaMask wallet, for example, okay? And you can do a lot of different things with this, okay? You can you can just send it uh, any arbitrary transaction that you want to. You can provide uh, the data that is supplied in that transaction. You can, you can send cryptocurrency uh, like Ether with that transaction, okay? And you can do it a couple different ways with some particular nuanced differences. So uh, Solidity, you know, supports global variables like message. Uh, and those global variables like message have things like sender, the person who's calling the function, uh, which we'll see that this has got some slight nuance to it as well. And also things like message value or message.value, which is the amount of cryptocurrency getting sent in with that transaction. And these will vary depending on what you use here, call or delegate call. So let's look at an example. Okay, so again, these are the global variables inside of Solidity. Uh, there's lots of different ones, but here are the ones we're concerned with are things like message. All right, so message value and message sender. Okay, uh, the number of ways sent with the message and then message sender. Uh, so that's message value, message sender, the message of the current call. Okay, so uh, let's look at delegate call versus call. So uh, according directly to the Solidity documentation, I'll just read it word for word here, there exists a special variant of a message call named delegate call, which is identical to message call apart from the fact that the code at the target address is executed in the context, i.e. the address of the calling contract and message sender and message value do not change their values. That's the really important part here. So let me just uh, pull up a diagram on my screen that illustrates this. So essentially, let's have a scenario where you have a user, an externally owned account or a MetaMask wallet, that's calling a smart contract that has a few different dependencies, okay? And let's say contract A, contract B, contract C. You know, contract A is basically just calling contract B and contract B is calling contract C. So in this case, you know, contract uh, A just uses call to contract B and then contract B uses call to call contract C. So in this case, whenever B is calling C, all right, message sender here is going to be uh, the contract B address, because that's who's calling contract C, okay? So in this case, uh, we have the exact same scenario, a user calling contract A, which calls contract B, which calls contract C, but in this case, when contract B is calling contract C, it's using delegate call. So the big difference here is that uh, message sender in this case is going to be A's address, not B's. So that's the really important distinction here is that uh, message sender and uh, message value do not change. So initially, if A is calling B and then B calls delegate call, this was the message sender of this call message. And therefore, when he uses delegate call, this value does not change. And message sender uh, stays contract A instead of this case, it's contract B. So that has many important implications. Let's see how that could potentially lead to a security vulnerability that could cause your contract to act. 
All right, so I've put a link in the description down below to a code example. Okay, you can just copy this link and then go to your terminal here. All right, I'm gonna put my terminal up on my screen and you can say git clone and then paste in the URL. Okay, and then whenever you've uh, cloned that, make sure you enter into this newly created directory like cd delegate call, uh, call hack. Okay, of course I've already done this, so it's not going to uh, make it happen for me. So um, the next thing you want to do inside of here is install all the dependencies. So this is a uh, hard hat project with just smart contracts inside of it. So you just want to do npm install. All right, I've already done this, so it's going to finish really quickly for me. Okay, and so now what I want to do is go ahead and open this my text editor. I'm going to use Sublime Text. You can use whatever text editor you like, and I'm just going to bump the font down here. And what we're going to do is go to the contracts directory and find this attack.sol, okay? And then also the test, all right, attack.js. So what I'm going to do inside of here is essentially just clear out all this code and start from scratch and rebuild this so that you can see how this works. All right, so I've gone ahead and reinitialized these files. So attack.sols will keep the smart contracts, all right? And attack.js is where we're going to write the tests. So I'm basically going to reproduce this same type of scenario where we have uh, three different contracts in play, A, B, and C, where, you know, in this case, you know, instead of A calling B and B calling C, um, you know, A is going to call B and then B is going to delegate call uh, C. And that can have some implications that can cause an exploit. So in this case, what we're going to do is basically have contract A uh, have a function that lets the contract set the owner, all right? So basically, we're going to have an address inside of here that just stores the owner of the current contract, all right? And then we'll have a special function, all right, called set owner that essentially just lets, you know, the caller uh, set the owner of the contract. So that's what contract A is going to do. It's going to say owner equals message dot sender. And then here, I'm actually going to use hard hats console log feature, which is really nice, which is going to let us console log uh, message sender in this current context. Because remember what I was saying before, that essentially uh, delegate call and call have different uh, message sender values. So we'll be able to witness that inside the code whenever we uh, actually do this, okay? So that's contract A, all right, contract A. Uh, so in this case, now we're going to go with contract B. Okay, so what B is going to do is store an owner, all right, just like it does with contract A. And then we're going to try, try treat A like a library. So B is going to be calling A is to do this set ownership, all right, and it's going to actually store the owner uh, in the state variable just like this. So we'll have a constructor uh, that essentially, you know, lets uh, the person who's deploying the contract store the value of A, all right? And we can save A as a state variable here. This will just be the uh, contract A here, okay? So we can call its functions. And so we'll store the owner as the person who deployed the contract right here, okay? And then we'll set the value of A, its address so that it can talk to the A smart contract whenever we create the function with this constructor function. Again, this is the function that is run once and only once whenever the contract is deployed to the blockchain. And so what we're gonna do is have a fallback function in here. Uh, so fallback uh, is a function that's solidity that lets uh, you know, solidity essentially execute certain code. It lets it receive ether from number one and it also uh, lets you execute any arbitrary code whenever uh, a transaction is sent uh, to the contract itself. So basically, we're going to have something called fallback external, and it's going to be payable. And what we're going to do inside of here is just say A, uh, you know, this contract right here, we're going to do delegate call, and we're going to forward any data that came into this fallback function to uh, A itself, but in the context of delegate call. So we could do this as call, all right, uh, or we could do it as delegate call. All right, and this is where the vulnerability is going to come into play because we're going to use delegate call right here with this interaction. Now, I think I also realized I mixed the names back up. Uh, I think really A and C should be swapped in this example, uh, but it, it's close enough, okay? You, you'll get the idea whenever we see the call chain. So finally, let's look at contract C. What's it going to do? Well, it's just going to uh, store the value of address B or contract B. 
All right, we're gonna set it inside the constructor function. Once it's deployed, we'll be able to talk to it. And essentially what it's going to do is have an attack function. All right, and what that attack function is going to do is just uh, call contract B, all right? And contract B is going to delegate call contract A. And whenever we do this, it's going to forward any uh, data, okay, to this with the context of message sender being this contract right here, okay? And whenever we do this, we can tell it to call any arbitrary function by just encoding uh, the function name with the signature, and it will call that function with the data, all right, when it uses call function, okay? So um, what's that going to do? Well, essentially, uh, whenever you do call, it's going to trigger this function right here, all right? And this function is going to trigger delegate call with any message data, and when we pass this in, this uh, encode with, with signature, we're gonna say, hey, basically call the set owner function. But when you call the set owner function, that's from contract A here, uh, the, the message sender right here will actually be contract C address, not contract B address. So what it's essentially going to do is contract B is going to change the ownership, okay, this owner right here, uh, to contract C not the person who originally deployed the contract. So what this exploit effectively does is uh, get all the access privileges associated with the owner of the contract and transfer them to somebody else. So basically it steals the contract instead of being owned by the deployer, it's now owned by contract C, okay? So let's uh, write a test that demonstrates this, okay? So inside of here, uh, this is just a basic truffle, excuse me, not truffle, a basic hard hat test that's going to essentially have uh, a before each function that we can do some setup code inside of, uh, a describe block that just says, hey, describe the attack, and one test example that it says it changes the ownership with the delegate call exploit. So the first thing we're going to do inside of here is uh, we're going to set up some variables for each deployed contract. So at the top, we're just going to say let A, B, and C. We're going to store each contract as a variable. Okay, and for uh, contract A, we're just going to deploy it first. Okay, so await uh, ethers get contract factory A. We'll say A equals await capital A deploy. Okay, that's going to be this first contract right here. All right, then we're going to do that also for contract B. All right, so const B, capital B equals ethers await get contract factory, you know, capital B, and we'll deploy a lowercase b. All right, then we'll finally do the same thing for contract C. All right, so we did that with B. And then, you know, with C, okay. And whenever we do that, we also pass in any any arguments that we need. So we pass in A's address whenever we deploy B, and whenever we deploy C, we pass in B's address just like this, okay. So finally, what we want to do is also uh, set up some accounts so we can uh, set up a deployer, and then also an attacker. Okay, and then we can just fetch the accounts from ethers like this. We can just say let accounts equals await ethers get signers. All right, and then we just break out the deployer address as accounts zero and then accounts one. Okay, this is a zero based index array, so we can just assign them like this. And then we'll log those to the console with the deployer addresses and the attacker address because this is initially going to be the owner of the uh, contract and we want to watch it change. So let's just do npx hard hat tests. Okay, to run the test initially, and I just want to make sure everything's set up properly, that our contracts compile, uh, and that we're getting those uh, initial console logging statements before we try to, um, you know, run the test, just to make sure everything's working properly. So we got some warnings here, uh, compilation warnings, don't worry about that uh, right now. Okay, let's just keep going. Um, all right, so inside of here, let's actually write the test example that demonstrates this. Again, we want to show that uh, whenever we deploy contract B to the network, the owner is going to be the deployer. And whenever we call contract C attack, that it's going to change the ownership of contract B to contract C's address. So inside of here, what we're going to do um, is first, basically just check the initial owner. So we'll do that like this. All right, basically we'll say, uh, we'll console log uh, owner of B, and we're going to say await B.owner. All right, that's going to call this uh, function right here. Again, this is a state variable, uh, so Solidity gives us an owner function for free that we can just read this address. All right, and then say expect await B.owner 
to equal deployer dot address. So that's this deployer right here. Okay. So let's just run the test, check that out. Okay, so now we can see the deployer address, the attacker address, the owner of B is the same as the deployer, which you can see that in the console and also our test checks for that. So now we can uh, perform the attack. So basically just say let TX equals await uh, C dot connect. So this is this contract here. I'm gonna call the attack function. So we just say, uh, we connect with the attacker address because that's how we want to perform the exploit. And then we call dot attack and we wait for the transaction to finish. And then we finally can just check that the new owner is equal to um, the new contract address or C's address. So we say console log owner of B. We say await B dot owner. It's the same line we did right here. Okay. And then we'll, we'll visually see it in the test, but also our test will uh, automatically check that B owner is equal to C's address, which is the third contract deployed here. All right. So let's save that. Run the test. And let's see if it passes. Boom. There you go. You can see that the owner of B is the new uh, contract address here. And then our test automatically changes for that. You can see how it changes. Here's the original address. Here's the new address. Okay. And finally, you can see message sender is logged to the console here. Uh, remember I said earlier that we essentially are using Hardhack's console logging function to actually inspect what message uh, sender's value is inside of here. Okay. And now we're seeing that actually logged to the console whenever we run the test. So this is coming straight from the smart contract code itself. And these other console logging statements are coming from, um, you know, the test examples. So this is a really handy thing to further visualize this. And that's why I left it uh, in the example here. All right, so that's a simple example of how you can witness this vulnerability in, you know, a sort of a sandbox environment where you can actually get your hands dirty with the code. But what about, you know, a real world example of how this exploit has occurred? Well, there's a very famous one called the Parity Wallet Hack. So if you've been in the crypto space for a long time, you might have heard about this. But if you haven't, this was a major, major, major event uh, in 2017. Okay, so... This was an example of, you know, how a contract was exploited because it used delegate call to forward messages, okay? So the attacker sent two transactions. I forgot to mention, this is a multi-signature wallet. So a multi-signature wallet is essentially a smart contract that holds large amounts of money that requires multiple signers in order to authorize funds transfers. So basically, instead of like having a MetaMask wallet where you just click a button uh, to send funds, uh, multiple different addresses have to essentially uh authorize a transaction before it's sent. they can call a function to authorize transfer and let's say you had a three of five uh, multi-sig scheme it means that like three different addresses would have to call the approval for the funds transfer before it can actually move so anyways in this case the attacker sent two transactions each of the affected contracts first uh to obtain exclusive ownership of the multi-sig so it, cha it changed the ownership just like i showed you earlier and then the second one to move all of its funds okay so basically, you can see the first uh, transaction was called to initialize the wallet right here. Okay. And then uh, the function was probably created as a way to extract the wallet's constructor logic to a separate library. This uses a similar idea to proxy patterns. Uh, but the wallet contract forwards all unmatched function calls to the library using delegate call. Okay. So it's basically just forwarding any um, message it doesn't understand to the other contract using delegate call. And that's where the vulnerability comes into place. Uh, basically, this causes all public functions from the library to be called by anyone, including a knit wallet, which changes the contract owners. <laughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, a knit wallet uh, does not prevent an attacker from calling uh, the con when the con after the contract was initialized. Okay, so basically the solution here would not be to use uh, delegate call uh, as one approach, but that's an example of how you know there was a delegate call vulnerability that uh, caused someone to take over ownership of a contract and also take out lots of funds. So I'll put a link to this down in the description below so that you can learn about this more, but that is a real world example. All right, so that's an overview of how to hack smart contracts with delegate call. Okay, so I hope you like this video. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so that more people can learn about blockchain. And if you like this video and you wanna actually learn these skills, you know, for real, develop a real world blockchain developer skill set so you can land your first job, then head on over to adaptiversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. 
You have to be an expert. I felt people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.